he is going to be talking about his charisma. <clears throat> Um, no, I should look at the share this. Three, 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 three. Well, it is. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not actually zooming out for all the people I told you can't zoom. I'm just recording this. Um, because I and I for our family. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> that's true, that's true. Um, can I just take a picture of you all? There's way too many people in here for this. It's just for my family. I hope you guys don't mind. As long as you share it. Just a second. Jeez. <laughs> um, kia ora tato, morena tato katoa, uh, ko matane toko ingoa, uh, yore ya minaki, uh, marti ya neva. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Martin Fisher. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about something that I, I don't usually talk about um, at all. It's probably the first time I've gone in academic, not academically, but in an academic environment with this stuff. Um, I want to give a shout out to Aroha, not telling it to me specifically, but in previous NZHAs, encouraging people to do their own histories as well, generally. So I um, just want to make it to you uh, for that encouragement, even if it wasn't to me directly, but out into uh, there. So I'm going to talk about my maternal grandmother, um, Maria Fulop um, Bontine. And um, Maria Fulop, uh, or Maria Nadi, you'll hear me say, so I'm going to say that Nadi just means grandma uh, in Hungarian. And so Maria Nadi is here on the right. This is probably my favorite picture uh, in existence. Um, this is my, yeah, Maria Nadi, this is my older brother, um, Matthias. And this is when he's arrived back to Hungary in 1992 to spend the summer there. We moved, we left Hungary as refugees in 1987, uh, and that was the first time I went back. Uh, he went back. I wasn't. I went the next year. Uh, this is Irene Nadi. That's my father's mother, um, who has her own history as well. Um, I'm not going to speak about her today at all. So I just want to meet uh, to to her. Um, she survived Mauthausen camps um, in the Holocaust. So just want to, sorry, <laughs> I'm supposed to cry at the end of this. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to recognize. It. So um, Maria Fulop was the one I'm going to discuss today. So she was born on the 19th of February, 1924, in a high mosque in Hungary. Sorry, I'm just going to compose myself for a second. <laughs> I'll be crying too, by the way. <laughs> it's, uh, it's mine to go last. Yeah, this is why we changed the order. <laughs> My friend Ash is here, and I went through this with her as well. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. She passed away on the 1st of January, 2022, in Budapest, using her memoirs uh, that my mum helped me translate. Um, last month, we spent three hours every morning um, I'm going to provide an outline of her life with a thematic focus, looking at her experiences in school, her work life in government and university, and the experiences of her family after being labeled as kulaks. <laughs> <laughs> We've got time limits. As kulaks, middle sized landowners under the earliest common re regime of the 1950s. Orient ourselves geographically. Well, Mac will let me not cry. <laughs> <laughs> Hungary, Eastern Europe, just to get ourselves centered. Um, Budapest, uh, I'm going to, Haimashke is right here, this red area. So you can see it's not far from Budapest and near like Boloton, our sort of uh, largest lake in Hungary. Uh, and then if we zoom in a little bit more, we can now see Haimashke there. I'm going to, this is where my, um, Great grandmother is from Shoy, and Veskrem is the biggest town, and that's where my grandmother went to high school. So, just wanted to orient ourselves geographically. Maria Nadi's father was Joseph Fulop, who was a farmer and a local magistrate. And Joseph Fulop married Rosalia Lawrence in 1906 from the nearby village of Vodish Bede, which wasn't on the map, it's nearby. And they had three children, two boys, Joseph Jr. Uh, and Geza, 
uh, and one girl, Yola. And when Rosalia was um, only 32, she died suddenly. So I'll come back to this photo. Let's go back to, to these two. When Rosalia was 32, she died suddenly. And this left Joseph in a very difficult position, having to raise three children under the age of 10 as a single father. He remarried to Maria Nagy's mother, so my great-grandmother, uh, Maria Sabo from Shoy. You can see there on the left. About a year later, she was 10 years uh, Joseph Jr. And my grandmother claimed that it was not a marriage of love in her memoirs, uh, but one of duty and partnership, mainly to help Joseph raise his children uh, from his first marriage. Maria Nagy was their only child but she lived together with her half-brothers and sisters as if they were a regular family. I know that's a weird way to term it, but, you know, they lived together um, quite normally as a nuclear family. Maria Nagy noted that their parenting principles place emphasis on hard work, honesty, and no corporal punishment. My grandmother's mother, Maria Sabo, was largely raised by her father, Shando Sabo, and because Maria Sabo, her mother died quite suddenly when um, Maria was only five. Maria Nagy, a lot of Maria's Maria, <laughs> Maria Nagy, my grandmother, noted particularly her grandfather, Shandor Sapo, so this is obviously Maria Sapo's father, um, who she loved very much and from whom she received back much love and encouragement. And when Shandor was on his deathbed, he forced his daughter, Maria Sapo, to swear that she would have my grandmother up there in the middle, Maria Nagy, educated. And both Maria Nagy's mother and father, and indeed the whole family, worked to fulfill that promise throughout their lives. Now, when Maria Nagy turns six, she was enrolled in the primary school run by the Reformed Church of Haimashkir. Based on her excellent results, her teacher, another Shandor in the middle there, uh, and, the, and the village priest, Joseph Kutzi, to his left, uh, urged and suggested to the parents that she continue her studies. At that time, only six years of primary school was mandatory, and that is largely where the education of her siblings had ended. She, was, she went to secondary school, high school, in the nearby town of Vespre that I showed you before, traveling every day from her village. Now, in addition to continuing her study, my grandmother's parents also sent her off to summer camps run by the Reformed Church. So they're, they're Calvinist. Uh, it's not really a thing here, but Calvinist kind of church at Lake Bolotum called Soli Deo Gloria. Students from around the country would gather together for several weeks, and Maria Nagy wrote that the camps meant a lot to her. And they increased her knowledge of religion, ethics, and the cultural diversity of Hungary, believe it or not. Uh, she mentioned that the diff different ethnic regions of Hungary were celebrated at the camp. Oh, shit, I should have gone to this. This is her high school. Uh, were celebrated at the camp, and the campers were taught the fine arts of the different peoples, including embroidery, carving, uh, wood carving, and ceramics. She also discussed the positive effect of the camp in terms of what we might refer to today as cohort building. They raise the Hungarian flag every morning. And I've got some photos here. There they are raising the flag in the bottom left. Uh, learn church songs. And during the evening, there were big campfires. Those she described as famous writers and public personalities delivered lectures to the campers. When she would return home to her village, she'd share this info with her mates uh, and other high school students you know, who couldn't attend. Um, now, my grandmother noted that her further studies had caused problems in the village because it was very unusual for girls to be educated beyond that point. But because her father had a leading role in the church in the village and was also a magistrate, he had to listen to the concerns of these villagers. But while he acknowledged those, he also remembered the vow that his wife had made to her father that my grandmother would be educated. Now, after finishing high school, she was allowed to move to Budapest to begin her post-secondary studies. It was the first time she had left home. Now, both of Maria Nagy's parents' families had holdings of between 18 and 28 hectares of land in Haimashgir and Shul. Her father's land um, where they lived was described as extremely bad quality for the area as it was full of stones. Providing for the needs of the family required extremely hard work, 
Although she described her childhood as filled with love and support, and you can see it in these family outings, they made their own sort of bootleg wines, um, and that's what they're doing on the left there. And but nonetheless, with the difficulties of these lands, it and her experiences growing up in this, you know, played a major role in her willingness and desire to study and to look for further opportunities to make a living. My grandmother moved to Budapest in September 1941. Hungary was in an uneasy alliance with Nazi Germany. It had to send its armies to fight the Soviets, but it refused to deport Hungarian Jews, for example. It was not until 1944 that the war would truly arrive to the city. Now, she attended night school because she needed to work to support herself. Her parents paid with food from the farm for her accommodation and meals, staying with the village priest's friend's wife, you know, all these kind of village connections. My grandmother worked first as a typist and then as an accountant. Now, once it became clear that the Nazis were losing, they finally invaded Hungary and put in power the vile and detested homegrown fascists, the Arrow Cross. The deportation of Jews and other so-called undesirables began in earnest. Until 1944, you know, Budapest had been able to escape this, um, but it finally became very dangerous. And my grandmother's employers took all of the staff to Lake Balaton, and she lived there in the cottage of a writer. Now, a story that has been handed down in my family was that my grandmother was one of the last passengers aboard the tram crossing the Margaret Bridge right before it was destroyed in 1944. This is not the Margaret Bridge. This is Lance Heat or the Chain Bridge. I don't have a picture of the Margaret Bridge, but the Margaret Bridge is just up the river. You know, you can tell it's the Danube uh, that we're on here. Um, and the Nazis mined the bridge to not let the Soviets cross. Um, and and you could see in other images, which I don't have, but I've seen before, like tr like the trams in the water. Um, a lot of people died on those as well. Now, I've previously heard the story. It's something handed down in my family, my mother as well. It does not appear in these memoirs, which is just interesting. Although my grandmother was only 75 kilometers from her parents, she did not have any news from them for months because the Russians, at that time, a liberating force, were still fighting the Nazis on the west side of the country. In her memoirs, my grandmother stated that she only returned to Budapest on 13 December 1945. But Budapest had been liberated in February 45, and Hungary completely by 4 April 1945. So it's unclear why it took her so long to get back to Budapest. She tells a story in the memoirs about how she finally got word to her parents that she was safe by taking out an ad in a newspaper. The notice stated that she was looking for her brother-in-law, Dula, who was in the army and who had participated in the fighting around Budapest. At first, only cargo trains were running, but someone from her village working on the trains had seen the notice. He cut it out of the paper and left it with the various goods that were dropped off at Heimaschkin. One of her parents' neighbors had read the notice, showed it to her parents, and that's how they finally knew that she was alive. She lived back on the same street in Budapest where she was hidden together from the marauding Russian soldiers with the daughter of the superintendent of the house. Although they were a liberating force in theory and better than the Nazis, you know, it's not really a, a high bar, they raped young women and kidnapped young men and sent them back to the Soviet Union. Her future husband, my grandfather, George Lonti, was taken twice by the Russians as a young man, but he escaped both times. By early 1946, the trains were open to passengers and she could finally return to visit her family that she had not seen since 1944. My grandmother was able to finish high school in Budapest, but she and all the other students were unable to sit their exams because they were involved. This did not become an impediment to her continuing her studies as special entrance conditions were advertised in the newspapers in early 1946. Maria Nagy was accepted to the University of Joseph Nador, and she continued studying at night school so she could keep working. After two years, she received what she calls a quiche diploma, a small diploma. And this is it. I've got this at home. Um, I got it all framed properly. Um, and um, just as she finished this first mini degree, political and social changes began to sweep across the country. 
The monstrous autocrat Matthias of Appleshe was installed by Stalin in sort of 48, 49. So you basically have like three years of a real democratic experiment. Um, and this is obviously unwound. And the political and social change becomes the order of the day. And the University of Joseph Nato was renamed very inventively the University of Karl Marx. And it becomes a strictly Marxist institution. All students had to re-enroll and pass a strict entrance exam. Maria Nagy recounts that the new entrance exam was described as tortuous by all the students. My grandmother was about 15th in line on the day of her examination, which was an oral exam where the students had to answer questions from a panel of academics. This is just some uni propaganda. Um, we have that the economics university awaits you. And who's teaching at our universities? And we've got all our lectures. We even have one woman there. Exactly. <laughs> and we have my grandmother involved here. She's the only one staring at the camera for this little shot on the back of the pamphlet at the library. Um, and we've got a very famous lecture of her I'm going to talk about here, Imre Knight. Now, student after student that emerged from the exam were quite upset with many breaking down in tears. When my grandmother sat down for the exam, she spent about 15 to 20 minutes discussing what she had learned in her previous two years of study, and things were looking positive. Finally, they asked her, had she read anything from Marx's Das Kapital? And what was her opinion of the political changes occurring in the country? My grandmother told the panel that she had not read Das Kapital and that she was from a small village. She told them that she'd been ed educated purely to the church's various schools and that her parents were farmers. There was almost no industry in the village and amongst her people, communist literature was unknown. Now that questioning itself was you know, a bit disingenuous. It's up till 1945, Das Kapital was banned from circulation. <laughs> and at the most, only hundreds of people would have even known passages or chapters, much less the entire book. But to my grandmother's surprise, her honesty was rewarded. Apparently, she had been the only student that day to have honestly answered the question. <laughs> and so she was re-enrolled. <laughs> she studied agricultural economics for the next two years under the head of the faculty, Imre Nagy. Now, Imre Nagy becomes this incredibly tragic figure if anybody knows anything about the 1956 revolution. For better or worse, he's elevated to this role of the leader at the time, even though he's a Marxist, he spent, I mean, he's on the Hungarian side of the Soviets, but he still spent all of World War II in the USSR. Like, yes, it, it was it, it was devastating what happened to him, but it's a very complex kind of story. But amazing to me when I obviously found out that he was her lecturer. And she studied under him. He was the head of the faculty. Universities in Hungary at that time were organized on a subject basis. So there was an economics university and then an arts university, an engineering university, science, and law. Now, as she had to be enrolled in daytime streams, she had to give up her accounting work, and instead she made extra money tutoring students and doing typing. The extra income was necessary because under the new political, social, and economic environment imposed by Akoshi, her parents' economic condition worsened. They could no longer send her much food to help with living costs. She moved closer to the city on the Buddha side, because she was on the Pesh side before, uh, to live with the family of a friend of the village priest's wife. Their apartment had been hit by a bomb during the war, and her parents helped fund the repairs of one of the rooms. So she lived in that room in exchange for, for free. As my grandmother was part of the first graduating class under the communist-controlled education system, she and her fellow graduates got into high professional academic and government positions very quickly. There were future deputy and cabinet ministers, vice chancellors, senior managers, professors, heads of scientific institutions, directors and ministries, and at various SOEs. My grandmother remained friends with a number of her fellow graduates for their entire lives, just like that picture there on the right. Three of the professors would later both teach my parents during their time at the same uni in the 1970s. And before graduation in 1950, she was honored with an offer to become a lecturer and researcher by Professor Imre Nagy. But my grandmother politely rejected the offer because she felt she was too young and inexperienced. 
Instead of working at the university, she was directed to work at the Ministry of Labor as an advisor, but she quickly rose up the ranks. Then she was moved to the Ministry of State Farms. There she became department head and later as the secretary of the ministry. She was only in her late 20s and was managing a group of 17 officials at the ministry. But this was to be the highest position that she achieved actually in her entire life. But it came with certain costs. Part of her work in the Ministry of Labor was organizing workshops for workers from conglomerates, uh, agricultural conglomerates across the country. During one of the workshops, someone filed a complaint about my grandmother. This was during the Rakoshi era that I've discussed before. It was very repressive before the thaw that occurs once Stalin does. The person who filed the complaint questioned how it was possible that someone like my grandmother, whose parents were kulaks, right, small landholders, were presenting at such a national workshop. How was Mariana? In her memoirs, Mariana described this as the beginning of an avalanche of investigations with several false witnesses. Her parents had been illegally placed on the Kulak list because of the amount of land they owned. But as I noted earlier, the land was of extremely poor quality, and so they should not have been placed on this list. My grandmother noted that getting on the Kulak list destroyed the life of her parents. They had asked for a review and eventually were removed, but this took over a year. They became very poor, as during the Rakoshi dictatorship, Kulaks had to give all of their produce to the state. And my grandmother writes, podlash uh, leshe that they sweep away all of the um, supplies. Her brothers and sisters were also affected. Her brother Geza was accused of hiding food from the communists, and he had to serve time in a labor camp. These events made my grandmother physically and psychologically <laughs> ill. The matter was resolved once her boss visited Haimashkeid and had the family's name cleared. Maria Naji offered her resignation, but it was rejected, and she stayed on for a few more years. When she was on maternity leave in 1955, pregnant with my mother, who you can see down here as a, a one-year-old, she was attacked again by the same people who had accused her of being the daughter of Kulaks. Just prior to the failed revolution of 56, she had the matter finally put to bed with the accuser's reprimand. Ironically, during the brief period of revolutionary rule in late October 56, she was accused of being a communist sympathizer after being accused of being a kula. Now listen, <laughs> everybody working in the government and universities ever you have to be a communist party member. There's no doubt about that. All of this drama and pain led her in 57 to leave the government service once and for all and went to work in various positions at the prestigious Hungarian Academy of Sciences with her highest position working within the general secretary and president of the academy as the head of the secretariat. She finished her working career as the CFO and vice chancellor of the University of Horticulture. And I could write a whole other paper just on her working experiences, but I had to choose a little bit to, for this talk, so I'm probably already over time. But I'll just share that her bosses described her as someone who would tell their opinion to anyone, irrespective of their rank and title. That's how she described herself, and it's true. In addition to her work, she also volunteered for the National Council of Hungarian Women. She later became co-president of the Agricultural Council and volunteered for the National Council of Hungarian Cooperatives. While Maria Nagy was very conservative in a religious sense, she was an active and proud feminist. You can see her as one of the only women, certainly in this photo. Hungarian Academy of Sciences. As part of her voluntary work, she visited several countries such as the USSR, East Germany, Italy, Romania, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Switzerland, France, India, Greece, West Germany, Belgium, and Slovakia. I'm not quite sure where I'm going to go with this research. It might just be something for my family. Um, but her experiences as a young girl and later a woman in space is often filled with men point to an exploration perhaps of her life in terms of the gender roles that existed in Hungary throughout her life and how that might contrast with the situation today. She was a single mother who was for all intents and purposes a bit of a workaholic. <laughs> Nowadays, women in Hungary are encouraged to have more children above all else. More than anything, this presentation has been one of the most fulfilling bits of research I've done 
getting to translate with my mom her memoir, my Herman's memoirs, learning a whole lot about my grandmother, hearing her voice again. And these photos were the last time I was with my grandmother in 2019 in Budapest. This is Gabi, um, a, a cousin, a direct first cousin of mine, but a cousin of mine who took care of her um, for the last 10 years. That's not even her dog. We just went for a little <laughs> dog. We sat down and she just had this little dog <laughs> on her lap there. And it was bloody fucking COVID. I couldn't see her again uh, in person as well. But I hope you all enjoyed learning a little about my family history. Kia ora.